Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single one of those problems. If you are interested in watching the original solutions to any of these problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 173. Please turn to it. Page number 173. The very first problem that we see there, or rather the very first problem that we see in the second column, problem number 151. Problem number 151, the problem is already on the blackboard. This is what the problem says. The problem tells us that each night crew worker, each night crew worker is three-fourths as productive as a day crew worker. Each night crew worker is about 75% as productive as a day crew worker. Furthermore, we are told that the night crew only has four-fifths as many workers. Night crew has only 80% of the workers that we have in the day, in, in, a, in a day shift. The question simply is, what fraction of the work does the day crew perform? Of the total work that they do, in one day the night crew and the day crew combine, what fraction of the total work is performed by the day crew? Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. Here's the solution. The quickest, simplest, easiest, most economical way to tackle this problem is to pretend, let's just pretend, Give some number of workers that you want uh, in the in the day crew. How many workers do you want in the day crew? You can make up any number that you want. I'm just going to keep our lives very simple. I'm just going to pretend that we only have one worker in the day crew. Yes, I realize that there are four fifth workers in the night crew, and I also am fully cognizant of the fact that it's very difficult to hire four fifth of a worker. But that's okay. A little bit of brutality will take us a long way. Do you understand? That's okay. Let's pretend that we have. Let's pretend that the day crew has only one worker and let's just see what happens so here's the here's what we deal with night crew then night crew the very first thing we are told is that we only have four fifth as many workers so if we only have one worker in the day crew then one times four fifth is just four fifths you see we don't have to do anything we are also told that each of these four fifth of the workers are only three quarters as productive. So each of these four fifths of the worker that we have, we only do three quarters of the work done by the one guy during the day. There you have it. That's the, that's the amount of work the night guy will do. Night guy will do what 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 amount of work? Let's find out. The four is going to drop out, and it turns out the night guy will do three fifths of the work. In other words, night guy is only the night guy. When I say night guy, because the reason we say guy is because uh, now we're dealing with just one person, or if you like, night crew, if you like. Night crew, what this tells us is that, what does this tell us? This tells us that night crew is 60% as productive as the day crew. Now, I, should, I shouldn't use the word productive because they are, they are three quarters as productive. What we meant to say is night crew does 60% of the work that the day crew does. That's what that says. That says the night crew, night crew does 60% of the work that the day crew does. And once we understand that part, once we understand that part, the rest is very easy. We have to answer this question. What fraction of the work is performed by the day crew? That's it. We are done. So here is our day crew and here is our total. Well, day crew performs one work. Why one work? Because we have one guy and we are using that guy as our base, so his, his productivity is the 100%, and the other guy was three quarters productive. So he does, for every one work that he does, the night shift does 60% of the work. Which means if he does one work, the night crew is going to do 0.6 of the work, and therefore together, the night shift and the day shift do 1.6 work. There you go, we are, we are done. That's it. The amount of work done by day crew, which is 1, and total amount of work, which is night crew and day crew, which is 1 plus 0.6, which is 1.6. Let's multiply top and bottom by 10, so that we don't have to deal with this 0.6 business. 
and we end up with 10 over 16, which is same as 5 over 8. Voila, that's our answer. 5, 8. What fraction of the work does the day crew do? Day crew, in a given day, does 5, 5, 5, 8 of the work. I was about to say 5, 5, which wouldn't make any sense. Day crew does 5, 8 of the work, and there, therefore the night crew must do 3 fifth of the work. That's all. We're done. Let's go to the next one, number 152. Number 152. In number 152, we are told that a restaurant, restaurant meal costs $35.50. Meal costs thirty-five dollars and fifty cents. We are also told that the tip is between ten and fifteen percent. We're going to leave the tip behind at the end of the meal, and the tip is usually between ten and fifteen percent. The question simply is, what's the total cost? Let's find out the total cost. This is a very simple, very straightforward question. So there are two scenarios. First, we'll deal with 10%, then the 15%. So the cost of the meal is $35.50. And here's the 10% tip. 10% tip would be 10%. 10% 10 of 35.50 is very simple. Is don't make it don't make too much fuss about it. 10% of $35 is $350. Forget about this 50 cents. 10% is approximately uh, three dollars and fifty cents. That's it. That's it. Add them up, and we get we get uh, carry one. We get thirty nine dollars here, and then here is the fifteen percent. So we get thirty five fifty, and now we have to figure out the fifteen percent. This is already ten percent. So so well actually, I, I just said it. That that's ten percent. That's ten percent. Thirty nine dollars is the amount, including ten percent. Now we just have to add another five percent to it. Five percent of that amount. Five percent of three fifty. Uh, rather. Uh, 5% of uh, 3550 is going to be half of 350 because 350 was a 10%. Half of 350 is $1.75. $1.75. Again, I'm not going to make too much fuss about it. It's approximately $2, so it's about $41. So it's between $41 and $39. Do you understand? The answer is the answer is B. It's between 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 $39 and $41 because this $39 comes from here. This $39 comes from here, which represents the cost of the meal, plus 10%. Because that's the 10% right there. And then half, what we did is, we took a half of that amount, half of 350 half of 350 is $1.75, which I rounded it up to $2. Do you understand? That's all. Number 153. That, that, that was very straightforward. Number 153. In 153, we are told that the, the total weight of the two lifts, uh, the first lift and the second lift, we are told that the total weight is 750 pounds. We are lifting weights and the first, the amount of weight that we lifted in the first lift and the amount of weight that we lifted in the second lift together, we are told, is 750 pounds. We are also told that twice the first twice the first first lift was 300 more than the second lift So we have to get an equation out of this sentence. Twice the first lift, twice the first lift, twice the first lift is two times the first lift. That's this part, twice the first lift, two times the first lift. Was, was means equals, was, is, was, is, are, will be. Th that means equals. 300 more than, 300 more than the second lift. So second lift is our S and second lift, twice the first lift, twice the first lift is not equal to the second lift twice the first lift, twice the first lift is not equal to the second lift, it is equal to 
300 more than second left. So this is second left, we have to left, we have to add 300 to it. So that's our second equation. What is the question asking? What is the question asking? Number 153. What was the weight in pounds of his first lift? We're looking, we're looking for F. Now listen, I just realized, I just dawned on me that what we are doing here just now is all of this is unnecessary. It just occurred to me that we are making a misery out of, not, out of nothing at all. We could actually continue the way we are headed here and solve this problem in a very classical, very traditional, very orthodox, very conventional way, very algebraic way, like a good school boy or good school girl, but nobody's going to give us any brownie point for it. Do you understand? Nobody's going to give us any brownie points for it. Let's do a quick and dirty way. Here's the quick and dirty way. Look, there are five answer choices that are given to us. There are five answer choices that are given to us, and those are 225, 225, 275, 325, 275, 325, 350 and 400, 350 and 400. This technique that we are about to do is called, is called bag solving. And what we do in the back solve is that we say to ourselves, that, and this technique only works, listen very carefully, this technique only works when the answers are numerical. When the answers are numerical in the exam, they are always arranged either in ascending order, like they are here, or in the descending order, either in increasing order or decreasing order. In other words, they never mix up the answer choices together, where the first answer is 5, the next one is 3, the next one is 13, it doesn't work like that. If you have three answer choices which are 5, 13 and 3, they're going to be arranged in order, 3, 5 and 13. They are always arranged in ascending order or descending order, which is why this technique works. So what you said to yourself is that the correct answer, whatever it, it is, has to be one of these five answer choices. Let's start with the middle and see what happens. Let's start with the middle bit and then what happens. If it works, it works. The answer is C. If it doesn't work, then we will know whether it's too big or too small. If it turns out we, that 325 is too big, we're going to try one of the other two. And we try one of the other two and then either it works or if it doesn't work, then the remaining was the answer. At the worst, in the worst case scenario, in the worst case scenario, we'll have to try only twice. So that's what we're going to do here. Let's pretend it's 325. The question is, what is f? We're going to pretend that f equals 325. And we'll see if it works. So 2 times f, 2 times 325, we are told, we are told twice the first lift, which is 2 times 325, has to equal 300 more than the second lift. Well, if the first lift is 325, and together they are 750, if together they are 350 and uh, 750, and we're going to pretend that the first lift is 325, then the second lift would have to be 435. Oh, that's not, that can't be right, can it? No, it should be 425 because we, care, we borrowed one. It should be 425. 425 plus 300 is 725, and this is only 650. This doesn't work. What do you conclude from this? What do you gather from that? What we gather is that this amount is too little. We need this, this, this amount, the, the first lift, to be higher amount. We need this first lift to be higher amount. Let's try next one, 350. 2 times 350 has to be 300 more than the second lift. Now, if it's 350, this is, no, this is gone. If it's 350, if the second lift is 350, then the first lift would have to be 400. Let's put it in here. Now, 400 plus 300 is 700. And 2 times 350, 700, it checks. The answer is D. That's it. This is called back solving. Now, if you like, we can actually do it the traditional way. If you're hell bent on it, if you feel that this is cheating and if you don't like it, we can do it the traditional way just to please you. Okay? Just give me a second. Traditional way is not that complicated, it's very straightforward. We can do it right here. I'm just going to erase this part and just stick it right in there. Okay, so this is our equation. 2f's, 2f's equals s, which is 750 minus f. 750 minus f plus 350. And we are done. We just have to solve this equation for f. Bring the f to the other side, we'll end up with 3f's. Add f to both sides, we'll end up with 3f's and 350 plus 300. So 750 plus 300 is going to be 1050. 1050 and now we have to divide that amount by 3. That's what it is. Let's do it right here. 1000, 1050, we have to divide that by 3. 
First of all, is this number divisible by 3? Can that can we divide 1050 evenly by 3? How do we know? How can we tell if the number is divisible by 3? Well, we have learned this thing many, many times. If the sum of the digits, if the sum, SUM sum of the digits is divisible by 3, then the number itself is divisible by 3. Here, the sum of the digits is going to be 1 plus 5, which is 6. And since, this, since we can divide 6 by 3, we can divide 1050 by 3 evenly. Let's do it. How many 3's in a 1? One has no threes. One has no threes. That one goes and joins the zero becomes ten. How many threes in a ten? Ten has three threes. Ten has three threes. The remaining one is going to go. Remaining one is going to. Remaining one is going to go to the five. The remaining one is going to go to five and become fifteen. How many threes in a fifteen? Fifteen has five threes. How many threes in a zero? Zero has no threes. Follow. Three hundred and fifty, which is what we found, which is what we thought before. Three hundred and fifty. F equals. 1050 divided by 3. That's all. Okay. Don't get confused. This, this equation does not follow after that. This equation was earlier in the story. This equation is somewhere here. That's it. We're okay, done. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Number 154. Number 154. Let's see what we can do. Number 154, I need my break. We are told that we collected 154. We are told that we collected exactly, exactly $599. Now when they use the word exactly, of course, it has a meaning. It has, it has some significance, obviously. We will realize the significance of it in a second. We are told that each person gave, each gave at least $12. In other words, nobody gave less than $12, everybody gave either $12 or more. The question is simply this, what is the greatest number of people? The greatest number of people, you understand, not the least number of people. If they were looking for the least number of people, the answer would be very simple. The least number of people you can have, in which case it wouldn't be a people, it would be just be one person. One person giving you exactly $599, which is a... Which, we, which would satisfy the condition that each person gave at least $12. The question here is not the least, the question is what's the most number of people could we possibly have in this scenario, such that the total amount that we collect is $599 exactly, and given the fact that nobody gave less than $12. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. What we have to do here is to ask yourself, what would have happened if we did actually collect exactly $600, if we had collected exactly, if we had collected, this is this is conditional. You understand? This is hypo, not conditional, rather. That's not what I meant to say. This is hypothetical. This is a purely hypothetical statement. You understand? This is a purely hypothetical statement, a speculation on our part, if you like. What would have happened? What would have happened if we had collected exactly six hundred dollars and not five hundred ninety-nine? And if everybody had given us not at least twelve dollars, but exactly twelve dollars. Exactly $12, 12 divided by 60 has 5 12, so that's exactly 50. But that is not what we have. What we have here is 599 and the fact that everybody gave $12 or more. Everybody gave $12 or more. So what we're dealing with here in the situation is this. The, the situation that we're dealing with is this. We have, we have n number of people we have n number of people, each one of them we are told, it, 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 it says at least, it says at least, but when I put down 12 plus, what I'm claiming here is more than 12, it's okay, it doesn't matter. So something more than 12 times n we are told is 599, and therefore the n that we're looking for is 599 divided by 12 plus. Well, what is the greatest integer that you can find that would work here? The greatest integer that we can find here is not 50. The greatest integer that is going to work here, where so the 599 divided by some number here comes out to be a whole number here, is going to be 49. 
that's the largest number that, that that's the largest integer we can find we cannot get a 50 out of it we cannot get a 50 out of it because in order for this quantity to be 50 the top needs to be 600 and the bottom needs to be exactly 12 we're dividing the bottom by something larger than 12 so if you're dividing something if you're dividing the bottom by something larger than 12 then of course the answer is going to be something less than 50 if it's going to be something less than 50 then the question is what's the largest integer that you can find that is less than 50. It has to be an integer because these are people. The largest integer that we can find that is less than 50 is 49. The greatest number of possible, greatest possible number of people in this scenario would be 49 people giving you a certain amount of money such that each person gives you exactly $12. Or ex now each person gives you at least $12 and it turns out that when you added up all the contribution just by fluke it came out to be exactly $599 and you had 49 people in the scenario you couldn't possibly have you couldn't possibly have 60 you couldn't possibly have 50 people in that given the fact that everybody gave something at least $12 or more than $12 so some everybody gave you $12 or something more than that i'll see you tomorrow okay bye now